Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to, to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Thank you, Marcia. So last weekend, I was uh, in my hometown of Pineville, Kentucky. We went back for a kind of a combination family reunion high school event that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. I anticipated that it would be an emotional weekend, and it was, and so I went ahead and penciled in a message based on my reflections for uh, this Sunday. wasn't exactly sure what I would say, but it kind of all came to me as I had processed uh, the events and emotions of, of this past weekend. This is my hometown on the, on the bulletin cover. This is a picture of downtown Pineville, Kentucky. It's a little bit bigger than that because it winds on around on the left of where, where the fold of the bulletin is, some, some more houses and such, but that's pretty much it. That's where I was born and raised. That picture was taken from Chain Rock, which is another story for another day. It's basically a tourist attraction today, but it's up in the, in the mountains on Pine Mountain. It is part of the state park where we stayed in, at the lodge. And we hiked there Saturday morning, took that picture from off the top. And you can't see much of anything except just the small buildings and facilities. But if I could magnify it, I could show you the courthouse square. I could show you where my house used to be. It's not there anymore. It was replaced by a combination firehouse and funeral home uh, that sit <laughs> where, 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 I, where I grew up. That road going around, the you see, kind of outlining the city, that wasn't there when I was a child. We had a flood wall. If you, you can see the Cumberland River just to the right of that. And, and, and the river wraps around the city, and the flood wall protected us from floods, we thought. Until 1977, we had a massive flood that topped the flood wall, but, you know, filled the city up like a bathtub, and it had to all be rebuilt. As part of the rebuilding, they decided on a little bypass, if you will, around my hometown, uh, a highway that was built that now is the combination highway and flood wall for, for the city. So it's up higher than the original flood wall was. But my house was one of the victims of the re remodeling and rebuilding of town. Over on the far left, you can't see, if, unless you have a large print bulletin, you might be able to see it on the large print one. But that's the high school football field. And uh, that's the spiritual center of our hometown. <laughs> we were there on, on Friday night. Well, the occasion was, well, you can see it's just a beautiful place. It's part of the Cumberland Mountain Range, which is part of the Appalachian Mountains uh, that, that go into southeastern Kentucky, where we, we uh, were born and raised. But the occasion for the event was the induction of my dad into the Pineville High School Hall of Fame. That's no joke, we have a Pineville High School Hall of Fame. The, all 125 students in, in, in the nine through, grades 9 through 12, we have our own Hall of Fame that was started about 15 or 20 years ago, and every year they induct about five or six people in the categories of athletics and education, and then there's a general category called distinguished alumni. We were encouraged, my brother and sister and I, to submit a nomination for our dad uh, as a distinguished alumni. I'll try not to get emotional. I got emotional at 8.30, and I was okay at 9.45, so I'll, I think I'm over it, but if I'm not, just indulge me in, in, the, in this conversation. So we, we nominated him. We had a great time researching his life and putting together the nomination, remembering his achievements, uh, his, his outstanding career, uh, the outstanding kind of person that he was, and he was accepted, and, and that's the occasion for us going back on the Hall of Fame weekend. The great thing was 
my Uncle J.C. was also admitted as the other distinguished alumni. So it was my Uncle J.C. who's still living, who's 91 years old, and my dad. So my Uncle J.C. is my mother's brother. And so we had the whole family covered. We, there were 11 of us grandchildren of my mother's parents. And all 11 of us were there. So it was a family reunion. Uh, we got to see everybody, visit a lot. And, and early on, somebody said, well, how did it go? And I said, it was a memory of a lifetime which evoked a lifetime of memories. And then I thought, that is a really cool thing. I'm going to save that phrase. I'm going to use that in the sermon. A memory of a lifetime, which evoked a lifetime of memories. It was a flood of emotion, this reconnection with land and community and the mountains and, and the people who influenced your life and have, have influenced your life, not just family, but the whole of the community. I, I saw so many people that I remembered. I saw so many that I didn't remember, but I like you're a Roan, or you're a Combs, or you're a Maiden. I don't know where you are on the scheme of things, but remind me who you are. That's a, that's a great way to do that. Remind me who you are. Are you my teacher or my fellow classmate? I don't know. I've lost all sense of chronology. One guy I did recognize was a guy I played high school football with, David Asher. David now has a big Mountaineers beard. He's retired from the state, and he was arguably one of the greatest athletes ever to play at Pineville High School back in the days when we had some really good teams. Uh, David was the starting quarterback for our high school from eighth grade on. He started at, as an eighth grader and all the way up to senior year. The problem was I was also a quarterback and I was in David's class. So guess who the second string quarterback was on, on our team? But the, our senior year, for whatever reason, the coaches made a shift and they moved David to tailback where he could run and pass uh, and then they moved me to quarterback. So I was a starting quarterback my senior year in high school football, and I saw David, and, I, I, and my claim to fame is, hey, I'm the guy that beat out the great David Asher for quarterback his senior year. <laughs> so so that's, that's their running joke. I've got a picture, maybe I can bring it sometime and show you of David. But it was a powerful weekend as uh, we had the, the football game on Friday night, I had a reception, went over to the game, stayed till halftime. Uh, it's 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 an independent school district where all the other area schools have consolidated. So now you've got, we counted, Asher and I did 28 helmets on the Pineville High School side. 28 players on the team, the smallest school in the state playing football. Uh, we counted 60 helmets on the heads of the, uh, the other team, and the game wasn't close, let me just say. It's there, there, there. <laughs> but we only stayed till halftime when they brought us out onto the field at halftime, introduced everybody, the inductees, and then the family representatives, in my case, who were receiving the medal in, in honor of their, their loved ones. <laughs> okay. It was a memory of a lifetime, <laughs> which evoked a lifetime of memory. So you got, you got to understand. They had a great banquet on Saturday night at the lodge. It's beautiful. Pine Mountain State Park is a beautiful park. And we were up on top at the lodge and they had the banquet and they showed a, like slideshows of, of the inductees. And they showed a video that Asher and I made for our dad in our case. And it was just a very powerful, well-run, very efficient uh, kind of weekend. I was pleasantly surprised. It wasn't the hokey small town thing at all that I thought it, that it might be. It was so well done and, and every little thing was covered and it was an, a, really a weekend of great honor and reconnection with my uh, family and my, my roots. And it became quickly evident that this really needs to be an October Father's Day message. Uh, so. It, I beg your indulgence in offering Father's Day, not in June, but, but in October, because ultimately it was about our dad and the influence that he had on our lives. I want to talk about that, but I want, I want to base, look at, have you look at the Scripture first. The Scripture from Luke chapter 11, there's, there's one important thing I want to point out. Jesus is talking to his disciples about God's desire to give. And really, that's what it's about. It's not about fathers. It's about our Heavenly Father and His desire to give. So we're going to major on a minor today, but we're going to get to the majors in the, in the next few weeks about all that God gives us. And this is about Jesus saying, ask your Father for what you need. And then He brings in earthly fathers into the conversation as a point of reference. And He says, if you earthly fathers who are evil, did you catch that? If you earthly fathers who are evil, now in the context, that, that doesn't mean wicked, horrible, mean people. In the context, it means 
if you earthly fathers who are clearly imperfect and clearly sinners, in other words, he's saying, did you ever do an essay that said compare and contrast? Did you ever have one of those questions on, a, on an exam? Compare and contrast? That's exactly what this is. It's compare and contrast. Because there's contrasting things and there's comparative things. The contrasting thing is earthly dads are not like the Heavenly Father. They're sinful. The Heavenly Father is perfect. Earthly dads are Im imperfect. Heavenly Father is perfect holy and perfect and righteous and good. And, and it's important that we understand that because I've heard people, and some, it seems like more often than not it's been, it's been females who say, I had a horrible relationship with my earthly dad. He mistreated me, he abandoned the family, he, he was just really hard on us, and, and what little we saw of him was, was always painful. And so if God is like that, I can't believe in a Heavenly Father who's like that. Well, the point is, here initially, that God is not like that. God is different. Don't look at your earthly father and expect to see your heavenly father. Because you earthly fathers are sinners. You earthly fathers are imperfect. Is everybody following me so far? You, you see what I'm saying? So that's the contrast. Don't base your image of your heavenly father just on your earthly father. That's an unfair comparison. But the point of comparison is that... You earthly fathers who are imperfect, even in your sin and your sinfulness, you're capable of a limited good. You're capable of doing some things that are good. For example, if, if your son comes and asks you for a fish, you don't give him a snake. No father would be that cruel and torment their child in, in that way. If a, an earthly child asks for a, an egg, you would not give a scorpion. That would be cruel. That'd, that'd be unheard of. So even you imperfect earthly fathers are capable of a limited good. And in the same way that you are capable of giving some good stuff to your children, so then the Heavenly Father can give perfect stuff to us. And that's ultimately the point of comparison. And so I was drawn to this, what good stuff did my dad give me? And, and I want to I just share some of the things that, that my dad gave me in the course of my lifetime, and gave us, my brother and sister as well. Faithfulness and loyalty is the first thing that comes to mind. He was loyal. He worked for the same company all of his career, Kentucky Utilities, and he, he passed up other opportunities to move the family for more lucrative jobs. Could have made a lot more money in other places if he'd wanted to, but he stayed. He was loyal to Pineville, Kentucky, loyal to the First Baptist Church. We sat in the same place in the back right in here every Sunday morning at, at 11 o'clock service. And, and he wasn't the spiritual leader of our house by a long shot. My dad wasn't. But he was in church every week, and we were there with him, and it was expected. We'll be there. You know, I think the fact that I've been here 29 years, I don't think that's entirely coincidental. I think it has something to do with what was modeled for me in terms of faithfulness and loyalty that I saw from and got from my dad. He gave us a great sense of fair play. You've got to be fair. You've got to be fair in all things. And don't show bias and don't show favoritism to people. And I saw him live that out in many ways. Guidance, protection, provision. He took care of our family. He was from that generation of men are supposed to work and be the breadwinner. Women are supposed to stay at home. And he basically forbade my mother from, from working outside the home. But she got a job with the courthouse, purging the voting records, and made a little money. And she came back and, and wanted to remodel the basement. Our living room was not a good family room, but we had, had to double as that. And we had a basement that was just an old basement, and she remodeled it, had it remodeled with paneling and linoleum and all kinds of cool stuff. And Dad was adamantly opposed to that. He hated that. He wouldn't move the TV downstairs. And so kids are going to go where the TV is, right? So after supper, mom would go downstairs in her newly remodeled basement room. All the rest of us would go with dad in to watch TV. So she ragged on him and ragged on him. And finally he decided to, okay, I've had enough. Got me to take the TV down. And he continued. After supper then, we would go downstairs and watch TV. Dad would go alone in, into the living room as his form of protest of, of all that had been done. Finally, about like three weeks later, he just showed up in the basement one day and never said any more about it, but he, he acquiesced. But that was, it was important to him to provide for his family. 
He gave me a college education, paid for it. I had no college debt. He also made clear that when you're educated, you're not welcome back home to live. <laughs> now you're on your own, you're, you go find a place to live, you pay your own bills, I'm done. But I'm, that's my responsibility to you. A down payment on our home here in San Antonio when we moved. We'd always lived in a parsonage. We didn't have any money. Church gave a housing allowance that we came to. What are you going to do besides rent? Because you don't have the down payment. But he came with the down payment for our house. We now own a home outright. And not many teachers have a home that they own outright that they can live in when they retire. Many of them have to find other ways to, to keep because they've always been in a parsonage. What an incredible gift. Discipline. Spare the rod, spoil the child was part of my generational value. And he, was, uh, he believed in that, and, and it was measured, but when it happened, you got the message, okay? <laughs> like, don't ever do that again. You don't have to tell me don't ever do that again. I know. I got it. I'll never do that again. It took one time for him to tell us and show us that this was wrong. Responsibility. He gave us this sense of personal responsibility. Don't be dependent on other people. Don't look to other people to take care of you. My father more than once said to me, I, you are my responsibility. I am not your responsibility. He would say, I brought you into this world. You did not bring me into this world. You're my responsibility. I'm not your responsibility. And that God instilled into us. Who's responsible for whom in the scheme of things? And being personally responsible for our lives and our work and their own welfare and, and their own provision. He gave us a great sense of freedom to choose their own path, where some dads arguably kind of try to control that and say, I'm going to raise you to be a major league baseball player or whatever it's going to be. I'm going to push you into this or push you into that. Our dad said, be what God wants you to be. Follow your heart and follow what you're supposed to be. I love sports. My dad played clarinet in the University of Kentucky band. He wasn't an athlete at all. But he supported me and my brother in all of their athletic endeavors. He didn't try to say, well, you just really need to be in the band. He let us be what we were and let us pursue what we wanted to pursue. Stability. Stability. A stable home life. That's, how do you put a value on that? But that's what we had. We changed houses one time in my childhood with my grandmother who lived across the street. Her house is bigger than our house. And by the time we had three kids, we switched. We just, we just tr walked across the street with her stuff one day. We moved into her house. She moved into our house. She had the smaller house then. We had the bigger house. That's the only move of, of my whole upbringing until I went off to college and ultimately to seminary. A lot of affirmation. He, he didn't praise. He wasn't like a, a backslapper. Uh, you know, but, but it's like there was this affirmation of the, communicated, I believe in you guys. I believe in my children. I believe what you're capable of. Now that's who I am. And even though he gave us our own path in life, it's not coincidental that the path we chose is very similar to the path that he was on because that's who he was to us. It's interesting as examples of God. You see material and spiritual provision in there, don't you? Down payments, that's a material thing. Freedom to choose, that's a spiritual thing. Personal responsibility, fairness, those are spiritual qualities. In our text today, in Luke, I don't know if you caught it, but Jesus at the end says, your father wants to give what to those who ask? It's there on the back of your bulletin. What did it say? Your father wants to give. In, in the same way that you earthly fathers are capable, so your father in heaven wants to give to those who ask. Does it say much more or does it say Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay, in Matthew 7, very same text, in Matthew's version, he says good things instead of Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever caught that. But it's significant that in Luke, it's Holy Spirit. In Matthew, it's good things. I don't think you resolve it by saying which one did he actually say. You resolve it by saying both are true. Heavenly Father gives us the physical stuff we need for life and the spiritual stuff we need. We are born into a world that's already here. We have air to breathe. We have abilities and intelligence and opportunities. Those are already built in. 
God has made provision for us to eat and live on this earth. God also gives us the spiritual qualities that go to the heart through his son Jesus Christ in particular who gives us the spiritual gift of eternal life and everything that goes with that. So that's what my dad modeled for us and that's an easy comparison to my heavenly father. So you, you listen and some of you go, man, I wish my relationship with my dad had been like that because I'm more cognizant of what I was deprived of than of what I was given. And I recognize that that's the case. Judy Sewald was an associate pastor in our church in the early days on Higgins Road. And Judy came from a, a difficult family situation. She had a difficult relationship with her dad. And she had been married and divorced in the time that she was serving with us. And she told me one time, she said, every time you tell one of those little, when I was a little boy growing up in Kentucky sermons about how great your childhood was, I just want to get sick. And, and, and I, I get that. Because it creates, the lady after church said, a sense of sadness. Because I, I, I didn't, that, that wasn't my upbringing. That's not what I got. Mine was more negligence, mistreatment, desertion. Some people say, I never even knew my dad. So what do you say to that? You don't have to, this is another whole series, but for today, you have to say, there's a hard road and it's called the path of forgiveness. And that's where a lot of people have to be over a lot of things. The path of forgiveness. Sue White was another associate pastor in our church for a while. And is a, a dynamite woman. And she was speaking at a luncheon one day here at the church. And Sue got talking about her dad. She doesn't even remember saying this. Because when I told her, she said, I don't remember saying that. And I said, yep, you did. Some of the most profound things you're ever going to say are things you don't even remember saying. At the same time, you're going to be attributed as having said things you never did say. So it, go, it kind of goes both ways. But Sue was talking about her dad and, and how difficult the relationship was and how one day she came to realize that's who my dad is. Generational sin, generational whatever you want to share, you know, the sins of the fathers pass on to the sons. His father had a hard time. It got passed on to him. And she said, I had to realize that he could not give me what he did not have. What I needed from my dad, he did not have to give. That was powerful to me. So I had to forgive him for not being who I needed him to be. I had to forgive him for not being who I needed him to be. Uh, that's a big can of worms, I realize. And we've got to come back to that theme at some point. But that's starters. There's a hard road called forgiveness. And we all got things that we were deprived of. And it may have been from your dad, maybe from your mom, maybe from some other source. But forgiveness is the only way I know out of it. To find peace of heart about whatever has happened that, can't, that cannot be changed. And go ahead and break the curse. Go ahead and break the generational thing. Uh, it's amazing how many people have said... I had a really hard time with my dad. And I decided that when I had a family of my own, I wasn't going to be that kind of dad. So I took the negative of what happened and determ became determined to make it into a positive for my children to give them everything that I was deprived of. And beyond that, we have spiritual fathers and mothers, really. But I'm talking from the male perspective today. Father figures in our lives that guide and mentor us to be coaches teachers to be friends paul says to the corinthians in christ jesus i became your father through the gospel i became your father through the gospel so i have a parental role now of guidance of spiritual and scriptural guidance to you as a congregation and as a people and we got to count on those people not just to give us what we didn't get from our own dads but to to complement and supplement all that we have been given already. And I have spiritual fathers. I have, I have father figures in this church. Pat Budd was a, a, a spiritual father, a father figure to me in many ways. Mel Amick is a father figure to me in this congregation. I don't want to just get into names. There's, there's more than just one or two. Mel's more in age like a brother to me. But he's mentored me and counseled me. 
and guided me in important issues and things through, through the years. So we all have to have those people in our lives. It may be your stepdad who's more of a father to you than your own biological father. It may be an adoptive father, maybe the only father you ever knew, but it's not your biological father, but it's your father for all practical purposes. I don't know, but we all need them. We all need to give thanks to God for them, and we all need to be cognizant of the opportunities we have as men to give others guidance as well. What did your father give you that you give thanks to God for? What did your father not give you that you need to be okay about and find a path of forgiveness toward? Who are your father figures? Who are your father figures? Who are you father figure to? I've said if you're a dad, if you've been blessed with that awesome privilege and responsibility, it never ends. And you have to understand the impact that your life is going to have on your children for the whole of their lives. My dad died in 1986. He's still the most prominent male figure in my life. That's the impact of a father. Don't ever say you're self-made, okay? <laughs> That's a joke. I'm a self-made man. Yeah, really. You conceived yourself. You birthed yourself. You came into a world that you created. You generated the air that you breathed. You changed your own dirty diapers when you were a kid. You fed yourself. Yeah, tell me how self-made you are. None of us is self-made. All of us is expected to do something with what we've been given, but none of us is self-made. We owe it all to a whole lot of people. May I be one of those people. May you be one of those people in my life. Let's pray. Dear God, this is a, the sense of our responsibility to one another and the opportunity and, and great privilege and challenge we have of, of mentoring and coaching and guiding and leading and providing all the things that fathers and mothers are called upon to do, all the things that people are called upon to do in the body of Christ and in the communities in which we live. Give us that sense of being able to make a contribution, of being able to shape someone for better. Help us to embrace that responsibility. Thank you for those who shaped us into who we are today and help us to do likewise. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to come forward this morning.